I would have paid to do this. <laughs> Today on the way out of the house, I went into the room where Hillary and I keep our mysteries because I wanted to count how many of Lee Child's 23 books I had still in our home. And alas, I only had 21. The other two were in Arkansas at the apartment I stay in when I'm there. Um, I love this book. Uh, once I became an author, people started sending books in galleys, so I read it several uh, months ago, or however many weeks ago I got it. And uh, so we're going to have a conversation here, and I'm going to honor his writing style. There is no outline. <laughs> I'm going to just let it take the story where it goes. But I'd like to begin by saying, um, let's talk about a few general things. You had, uh, as I understand it, aspirations to be in music when you were a little boy, and you just completed an album, which I think you should tell people about, so maybe we can sell the CD too. <laughs> so, tell them how old you were when you wrote the first Jack Reacher and how you got into it. Well, first of all, let me say thank you for doing this. This is uh, one of many surreal moments that I've had during my career as a writer, because my first four books and the first three years that I lived in this country, you were president. <laughs> and here we are. This is uh, very bizarre. Um, I became a, I became, I'm not, people say, when did I know I wanted to be a writer? And the answer to that is I, I never wanted to be a writer. I, I still don't want to be a writer. <clears throat> All I want to be is an entertainer. And plan A was to be in the Beatles. Um, <laughs> which I thought was a very sound plan, except it, there were three drawbacks to that. Number one, I was only nine years old. Uh, number two, they had no vacancies. And number three, I had very little musical ability. But apart from that, it was a solid plan, because what I wanted was the, the love and the approval that they got. I mean, you remember what it was like, the Ed Sullivan show, the, the newsreels of the crowds, just sheer joy and happiness on people's faces. And I thought, if I could somehow do that, how happy would I be? Because, uh, you know, all writers, first of all, all writers want to be musicians. But there's something very connected, I think, between music and writing. They are visual arts, you know, like painting or something like that. You see the whole thing at once. Uh, certainly, you can study it for years, you can maybe notice more details of technique, but you see the whole thing in one go. With music, it starts somewhere and it progresses and it ends up someplace else, the same as a book does. So I think there's a lot, a lot of connection between music and books. So being non-musical, but I could read and write, uh, it was always more likely I would be a writer than a musician. But I never really thought about it. I was in the theater first, then television, uh, I had a great, great job in, in television for a British company called Granada. Uh, we made Jewel in the Crown, Brideshead Revisited, Prime Suspect, Cracker. We had a great documentary series called World in Action. It was a great, great company. I loved every minute of it. And no doubt I would still be there. Except that one day my boss said something to me that made it just impossible for me to continue. He said, you're fired, <laughs> which was that 1990s thing, you know, they suddenly realized that instead of experienced professionals, they could get kids to do it for a quarter of the money. Really, Rupert Murdoch disrupted the British television market in a way that, uh, that was very, very destructive. And me and 300 other people from my company were thrown out of work. I was 40 years old, and I thought, can I afford to retire now? And sadly, no. So it had to be some, I had to do something else. And I thought, I, it was a very rapid transition for me. I only about a five year span between finally understanding that the books actually were written by somebody and produced and published. I'd previously just consumed them and never really thought where they came from. 
but I thought, yeah, okay, so he's writing these, and he's publishing these, maybe I can do that. And so that's what I chose to do. I thought, I've read some, how hard can it be? <laughs> Yeah, I thought that too. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're English, you wanted to be a Beatle. You worked in British television. How did you pick the central character of the next two plus decades of your life to be an American Army veteran who was a major in the military police? How did you pick the character? Well, I have to preface this answer by saying that as a commercial writer, you have to believe several things at once, but you have to believe them each 100%. It's not that you divide it up and believe it 50 50 or one third, one third, one third. You've got to believe them all 100%. And one of the things you've got to believe is yes, this is a, a, an art, it's a craft, it's a joy. It is creative, it is part of a long and honorable tradition that goes back centuries. But you also have to believe that it's a job. This is a commercial enterprise. Uh, it has to, in my case, it had to make my living, plus my family's. And so you start making decisions about what you're gonna do. And I looked around the, um, I looked around the other people that were starting out at the same time. And the standout guy for me in my genre was a person who had started a few years before me, but was still completely unknown, but I knew was going to be a big star. Because that was fundamentally my old job. Fundamentally, it was about knowing what the audience would like. And I, I read this person's stuff, and I thought, yeah, this guy is going to be huge. And that was Michael Connolly, who you know, did become a huge success. And in fact, just one. The, uh, the Diamond Dagger in Britain, which is um, the Lifetime Achievement Award. And I'm, I'm too polite to point out I won it three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, it, and actually, the Diamond Dagger is the most fabulous thing because for a long time it was sponsored by Cartier. And so it is, it is a full-size book like this, lying down horizontally, made out of gold. And it has a gold dagger sticking into it, and the dagger is encrusted with diamonds. And I thought, wow, what a prize. And what they do is they hand it to you for two seconds, and you have your photograph taken with it, and then they take it away from you and put it back in the safe. <laughs> and what you get is a plastic lapel pin. <laughs> uh, a but anyway, I was very happy to have the prize. But I, so I, I, I read Michael's stuff, early stuff, and I thought, he is really good. He is, and also he was representative of a lot of good stuff that was going on. Uh, saying this with the, the greatest possible respect as a TV person who understands these things, it was a soap opera. And soap operas are wonderful. Soap operas are really a sophisticated way of doing drama. And it is uh, very satisfying in a lot of ways, soap opera, because the responsibility is spread between so many different people. Like my daughter, for instance, loves Patricia Cornwell's books. And I say to her, really? You like K. Scott Petter? And she says, no, not really, I just like Lucy. In other words, there's a bunch of characters, like the Beatles, so there were four of them carrying the load. And the soap opera has many, many more than one character, so this, the appeal is distributed. But I see Michael doing that, so I thought, well, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna have a soap opera. The guy's gonna have no friends, family, neighbors, no nothing, no workmates, no job, no home. Michael's guy was called Hieronymus, so I thought I'm going to do the simplest possible name. <laughs> what is the simplest possible name? Jack or Joe? So Reacher is Jack and his brother is Joe. And so it was really about positioning the series different from what else was going on. Those are the choices. So I needed a guy who was alone. and. In my anecdotal experience, the, the people that feel most not at home in society are long-term ex-military. If they've been in the military, man and boy, as military brats, then they serve. They've spent their entire life outside the civilian world, and they don't know anything. They don't know civilian stuff. Um, 
their schools all over the world are replicas of American high schools. They, they know all the state capitals. They know how many uh, consecutive games Lou Gehrig played. They know all that American stuff, but they don't know how to make a phone call. They don't know how to buy a half gallon of milk because none of that stuff is in their life. So they come out of the military after, after many, many years and they are fundamentally dislocated, which is the, the effect I wanted. Now you can't do a guy like that in Britain because Britain is too small. There's no mystery about Britain. There's no empty spaces. There are no vast wildernesses with secrets in them. You know, Britain is a tightly, densely populated country. And you know, for instance, my second book, Die Trying, Reacher is, um, basically kidnapped in Chicago, thrown into a truck, and driven 2,000 miles to a Rocky Mountain hideout, which is self-evidently possible in the US, not possible in Britain. If you got kidnapped where I live and driven 2,000 miles, you're in Algeria. <laughs> <laughs> and so it needed to be America for the, for the frontier field because I'm still fascinated, just, I just love it. The, um, you know, on the coasts we live like we live, but the vast interior spaces, especially out west, we have a house in Wyoming now, and um, literally, if you, type our, if you type our zip code into the US Census Bureau website, it comes back uninhabited, <laughs> which it literally is. The state of Wyoming is the size of the United Kingdom, and it has fewer people living in it than this room. Uh, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> not quite. Well, Reacher, how many of you have read at least five Lee Child books? Okay, so you all know this. Basically, Reacher is rendered redundant by the end of the Cold War. And so he goes home. His grandfather's left him a modest house, as I remember, a place. He had a little money and he decides to spend next to nothing. And he just goes out traveling with the clothes on his back and a toothbrush and one or two other things and the ability to get money. It's a little catch and then things happen to him. He just shows up and things start happening. And we were talking about this before we came out, and a lot of people said, well, that's the device. That's the one thing that's sort of, you know, he has to make up, and then everything else feels really real. But I believe a guy like that, six foot five, keeps himself in shape, is an expert in physical contact, and had to be being an MP. I think if you wandered around all day, every day for a year and just hitchhiked wherever you went or took a bus once a year, and that's the way he does his book once a year, something highly unusual would happen to you. And so tell them how you start the book. I think, I mean, and, and do you agree that it's reasonable to think a guy like Richard would have one thing like this happen? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's totally reasonable. And people say it is kind of un unreal that he would constantly stumble into trouble. But as you say, it's not constant. It's one, it's one time a year. And I tell people, I write the other 364 books, but nobody wants to publish them because they're too boring, because there's nothing happening. It's just, you know, a reacher in the motel of China. Once a year, something bad happens, and that is, uh, you know, people here, I'm sure once a year something bad happens to you. And so, same for Richard. The way I, I, I have an absolute total aversion to outlining or planning because to me, the story is the only thing I'm interested in, the story. And if I work out the story, even in no form, even very briefly, even if it was just one page of scribbled notes, this happens, then that happens, and this is how it ends up, then I've told myself the story. I'm done with it, I'm bored with that story, I want the next story. So I never have a plan, never have an outline. I, in, I always start on September the 1st, which is the sentimental anniversary of when I started the very first book. And in August, I'm always panicking, I think, 
I've got no ideas, I'm washed up, this is it, they found me out, I'm a failure, I'm a fraud, this year is not going to happen. And then I think, oh, wait a minute, what about? And then I get an idea for an opening, opening sentence. And I write the opening sentence, and I, I have never, ever changed an opening sentence, ever. I've never edited an opening sentence, because I just think that organic feeling of a spontaneous opening, it cannot be improved upon. So I got my opening sentence, and I love the opening sentence because it's a unique sentence in the book. It is the only sentence that does not follow another sentence. It can be whatever you want. So I write the opening sentence, and then I think, all right, now what would be a good second sentence? <laughs> <laughs> That's how it goes. But you get clues out of your subconscious because in the, literally I wrote this first sentence without any thought whatsoever. It just came to me as I wrote it. And it mentions, Two things, Maine. Reacher has spent the, the end of the summer in Maine. Now he's heading south because it's getting cold. And, um, he's heading south like the migration of the birds in the air above him. And then there's a long, quite poetic list of birds that fly down the east coast, which my wife Jane helped me with because she's an ornithologist and knows this stuff. She gave me a list of birds which I rearranged to be rhythmically pleasant. And then, so that was the first sentence. It was time. And then I thought, well, two things occurred to me. Maine, Stephen King popped into my mind. Stephen King lives in Maine. Uh, I like Stephen, I like his stuff. So I thought, could I do a strand in this book that was a bit Stephen King-like? So that was thought number one. Thought number two was, why did my subconscious make me put in that bird-watching imagery? And that reminded me that many books ago, I had described Reach's father very briefly as a stone cold killer, a marine infantry officer, but uh, a bird watcher in his spare time. Because I thought that kind of humanized him and it, it made him, it pointed out the contrast. If somebody that is involved in this horrendous stuff, then on their time.